and welcome back to session three on day two of problem solving with Smithsonian experts. Today you're going to hear from Ellen Lupton, who's the curator of contemporary design at the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and Caroline Payson, who is the director of education at the Cooper Hewitt. You couldn't ask for um, a better for better hosts to walk us through this question about how does design solve everyday problems. And we are in the theme of world cultures today, valuing world cultures, and we've done two sessions to date that hopefully allow you to. Uh, think about that in some new ways and today we'll be looking at design being used to solve problems from different places around the world and we'll look at how different people have different problems or the same problems we'll ask you to help us figure that out and how they approach solving them I want to remind people who are new to our online environment that they have a number of ways to interact with us at any point on the left side of the screen uh, you can go ahead and type comments or questions into us um, if you're using your cell phone today you can send messages to 99503 just be sure the first word in your message is the word chat. And I have instructions for people who use Twitter and wish to tweet their comments and questions. And as we start, in a moment I'll be turning the floor over to Ellen and Caroline, but I'd like you to go ahead and start thinking about this question about what is design and what do you think of first when you hear the word design. That's over on the left side of the screen. You can send in your responses to that right now. Also, before we go on, I want to point out that the recordings from all of these sessions are available in the program area of the website, including the one we're doing right now. That will be there as well. Um, and there's also an exhibit hall area where you can continue to peruse information about all of these topics um, and uh, find your way to more Smithsonian resources than we have time to just cover in just our short time together. Of course, the event is produced by Smithsonian Education as well as Smithsonian's Office of the Chief Information Officer. And I'm Jonathan from Learning Times and pleased to be involved as well. Uh, we'll also be uh, thanking Microsoft Partners in Learning for making the event possible. So with that, I'd like to turn the floor over with some of these wonderful design responses coming into the chat uh, to our guests, Ellen and Caroline. Well, Ellen and I are delighted to be here. Um, we're from, as you mentioned, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, the only museum in the United States devoted exclusively to design. And we're here today to talk about how designers solve problems. As our inspiration, we'll be using the images and objects from our n upcoming exhibition, our next triennial, which opens next month, which we think shows the best of contemporary design from around the world. All of the things chosen for the triennial were chosen because of their ability to solve human problems. And that's what we're here to talk about. Great, so design is this big, big idea. And I'm, I'm looking at a lot of the responses that are coming in. People are talking about planning and they're talking about thinking and sketching and they're talking, talking about objects. And here are some of the kind of objects that come to mind when you think about design. It could be a really cool car. It could be what you're wearing. It could be the chair you're sitting in. It could be your house. And design is all of those things. And we're going to talk about some of the ways that those objects solve our problems. The first thing we're going to talk about is the way that design is a creative way to solve problems. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. What problem is being solved here? And, uh, and Carolyn, I'm going to go ahead and put a special box up next to this picture so people can stay focused up on that picture and type their answers right in there on the screen. So looking at this picture on your screen, go ahead and type in what problem was the designer solving? Well, as we look at this, we can see exactly with some great answers how many of us have sat at our desks and our pens and pencils are strewn all over. Here's an example of someone who took someone, a designer or a person who took a very something that is not usually used for this function but was able it does the job right those pens and pencils have a safe place to go they're all in one place and they're not going to fall all over the desk here's a new problem what problem was being solved here so let's go ahead and bring that question up we'll give you a fresh box to type your response in here so what problem is being solved by this by what you see in this picture. I know we have a lot of students out there. How many of you have seen this in your school? <laughs> we can see here exactly that often chairs in a library are very, or a computer lab are very loud. And here's a solution. Why is this such a good solution to this problem? What are some of the things that make this a good solution? Might it be, as you're saying, that it's not only, it is, of course, 
solving the problem. It's inexpensive. It's something that is in all our schools. All of our schools have lots of sports equipment around. Someone's saying you don't have to wax the floors as often. You don't have to wax, exactly. Uh, and someone's saying that old tennis balls are often found at schools. Yes? Exactly. So this is, again, a great solution to that problem and not a very complicated one. And one of the things we want everyone to think about as we go through this process is how some designs can, some problems can actually be solved rather simply and with some of the materials that are available. Okay, great. Yeah. I think it's nice that somebody mentioned that it looks cool, too. <laughs> and that is a big part of design, making our environment be really fun to be in. People are also talking about the effect that that design has on sound as well by keeping things nice and quiet. Exactly. So here's another problem. We're all familiar with, with solar panels, and that's a great way to create electricity and create heat for your house. But the problem is that often these things are just stuck onto your roof, and it's kind of ugly, and it's something you have to add to a building after it's built. So some designers got together and thought about how can we make solar panels actually better by making them part of the roof. So here's this amazing system where the roof tiles are actually individual solar panels. And so instead of this thing sitting up there on top of your roof, it is the roof. And we think that is a really cool idea. And that's what it looks like in a great house with a beautiful swimming pool, right? And so we'd like you to think about where else could you put a solar panel? really all you need is a place with a lot of sun, right? So you're not going to put it underneath the porch, but where else might designers find a place to collect sunlight, collect energy from, from the sun? And you can go ahead and type your answer to that question about where else could you put a solar panel on the roof. You can go ahead and put that in over on the left side of the screen in that chat box. Where else other than on a roof could you put a solar panel? Yeah, so give that some thought. One of the really important things about design is that design has a user in mind. We often talk about design as being a combination of form and function. And that is both the way it looks and the, the way it is able to fulfill its function. So the best way to determine whether or not a design is functional is to see if it does what the user needs. Take a look at some of the responses uh, you're getting here. Um, talking about people, say, putting it on the sidewalk, since uh, that would be a good surface. People saying putting it on, on bridges or outdoor walls. South and west facing walls. Yeah, right, because it's very important that solar panels be where the sun is. And so often um, designers are looking for panels that can actually track. They can actually change their position during the day and follow the sun. So here's an amazing design that was created in Scotland, and it's placed in the river that runs through the city, and lots of cities have big open waterways that actually collect lots of sun, and the water intensifies the effect of the sun as it's shining down. And so these things are called solar lily pads, and they actually change their position during the day so they can capture the most sun possible. And that's a really creative way of thinking about other flat places that are sunny in a crowded place like a city. It's also one of my favorite designs because it is very functional and it's also incredibly beautiful. Lisa echoes that. Uh, a lot of people commenting on the beauty of this design. Pretty amazing. To get back to our conversation about functionality, We're, and we're going to talk about, of course, the user. What are some, we're going to show three chairs, and let's talk about who those users might be. Which chair is for you? And we'll go ahead and put a poll up here on the screen, and we'd love to get your response. Go ahead and click on the, actually, we're covering up one of the chairs there. Let me move the poll over for everyone. So go ahead, A, B, or C. If you, had to, if you could choose one of these, which one would be yours? And this is a, a great way of looking at who our user is. Chair A might be for one, many of the students in the audience, something very familiar. And if you think about what that chair needs to do, 
It would be, there are several answers to that question. It, these are chairs that are stackable because of course they clean your classroom. And I see that very few of the, you guys are picking it as something you like, but it's probably something you use. It's stackable, you can move it for a classroom. Chair number two might be one for a teacher or somebody who works in an office. Um, what do you think it would be like in your classroom if there were wheels on your chairs you had all day? Chair number three, is a chair that's designed for comfort, right? We don't imagine this is a chair that would be at work or at school. And by the way, you also have this question about which one would be for Papa Bear. <laughs> so you can change your vote now, unless <laughs> the same one is for you. Uh, but uh, go ahead. And vote. Everybody like got that one right. Looks like everybody <laughs> knows that Daddy gets that chair. <laughs> and that's not a chair to work in. That's a chair to take a nap in, to come in and sit for a while after a hard day of work. It's funny you should say that, Ellen, because a number of people in trying to choose A, B, or C did say that it really would depend on the time of day for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a good. good point. Well, we want to throw up an alternative to the chair number chair A, which is an object in our triennial, um, the alphabetter desk, which is for kids to use instead of sitting in those chairs. The alphabetter desk is designed to let students either sit or stand or even move around their desk space while they're working. Researchers have showed, shown that actually by being able to do this, kids do better in school and why don't you let us know whether you think you would if this was your desk. Yeah, and this desk actually has a little foot pedal on it so that the kid can um, rock this pedal back and forth while she's working. And you know, a lot, of, a lot of teachers and parents might think that kids work better when they're completely still. Um, but, but actually, when you can move your body a little bit, it also makes your mind work better. So that's a really great new invention that we hope we'll be seeing in more classrooms. We have a, a number of students joining us today in classrooms from around the world. One classroom says, uh, their teacher saying that the entire class agrees that they would love these workstations. <laughs> so. It turns out these are good for adults, too. We all spend much too much time sitting in chairs. <laughs> this is another kind of classroom. This is called the Learning Landscape. Um, and it, this one was built in Uganda in Africa. And the idea is that Tires, old tires exist in every country in the world. This is a very common waste product. Um, and the designers here created an outdoor classroom where they took these old tires and buried them in the sand and created a grid. And the teacher can write numbers on the tires and play math games with the kids. And there's this natural energy that comes about as the kids get to run around and play a kind of competitive sport-like game and learn math at the same time. So a lot of times what designers are doing is, is thinking about how something like a classroom, that we all have a very fixed picture in our mind what that looks like. But designers look at it from a different angle and say, how could it be different? And how could we use the resources that already exist in another place? and create something that, that really works for the people that are using it. And I think as one of our um, one of our participants from Texas points out, this is something that's also um, helping us think about green design and this is something that is repurposing something else that would have gone to waste otherwise. And a lot of the designs we're talking about do have sustainability as one of the requirements to its functionality. Okay. Um, in, in many parts of the world, women spend a lot of time carrying water. These are in places where running water is not common. And women spend a lot of time every day hauling clean, safe water from one place back to the place where, they're li where they live. This is a great new design. Um, it's called the Solvatin Water Purifier. And it is, uses the energy from the sun to clean the water. A lot of water that's near where people live is contaminated with bacteria. And the only way to clean it is to boil it, which uses a lot of energy. But this technology uses energy from the sun to make the clean water. And that really changes the way people can live who, who inhabit these communities, because they can spend less time hauling water and more time 
being with their family or, or working or learning, going to school. We take that for granted, but this is an incredible resource to have better access to clean water. People are wondering, by the way, is this something that's available and how do they get one if they should need something like this? Um, this is um, distributed through NGOs or through non-governmental organizations to communities in need. So that's a good question. And then, you know, users are all different and, and people have different abilities to do things. So here's like an incredible design problem, how to create a camera for a blind person. How could a blind person record what's happening around them? This is an amazing design. It's by Samsung. It's a prototype for a blind camera. And the user holds the device up to his or her forehead um, and points it at something in the room. And the um, camera actually creates a three-dimensional image. Instead of a two-dimensional image, it's a raised picture that he or she can touch um, with, with their fingers. Um, and this is like an amazing device that takes something that sighted people are familiar with and we take for granted and turns it into a whole new technology that people who are blind can use. So it's a really nice um, idea to think about how can you create images for blind people. We'd love to get your ideas about that. Let's take a moment and use the chat area on the left. People are marveling at this, at this design innovation. We're wondering what other concepts or ideas could you bring to solving this problem? I see a great idea using sound waves, right? That you mm -hmm. could create pictures out of sound. Very interesting. Lots of good responses to this. There's a question, and it's just a good one for all of you to think about. Melissa, it's good that you're, you're, uh, we like the way you're thinking. Uh, she says, how would this reproduce 3D space, I guess, for people who have been sighted before or who were not born blind? Well, we'll it will create an image that they can feel. It's not going to be the same kind of image that we would be able to see, but it will be a raised image of an object in front of them and in the room. And by holding the camera to their forehead, that approximates the kind of um, vision point that a sighted person would have holding a camera to their eye. And the camera actually also records a little bit of sound with, with each image. And the pur purpose of that sound is to create a memory or reference point to what was happening when they took that picture. There's a question here in terms of whether this is capturing depth, or, or in Susan's asking, could it be used to take a picture of a painting so that they get a, a sense of feeling the painting? That's a really good question. I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but that's a great question. Good. Probably depends on what's, what's in front of you when you record the image. And here's another incredible piece of design for non-sighted people. It's a braille timepiece. And a question you could think about is, how would you help a blind person tell the time? Typical timepieces for blind people use an audio signal. So you could hold it up to your ear and you could, you could hear um, a sound that explains the time to you. Um, but some blind people object to that. They don't, they don't like it because everybody else can hear the sound too. And so a blind, uh, a braille timepiece allows you to silently check what the time is, um, which is much more discreet. Let's say you're on a date or in a class and you want to know what time, is, what time it is. You don't want to make a lot of noise doing that. You want to be kind of private about it. Well, Kim is saying that rather than making noises, it could tap on your wrist three times to say three o'clock. That's a good idea. It could also vibrate, right? It could send some kind of signal to your skin that would only be for you and not for everybody around you. One of the other important things to think about with design, as you're seeing here, is that design is all around us. Everything in our lives has been designed. Our clothes, our backpacks, our sneakers, our desks, our houses. And we wanted to highlight some designs that really make us think in different ways. This is a design from Sweden that makes the invisible visible. This is a power cord 
that actually gives people a sense of how much energy they use. We all know that we're supposed to use less e energy and to use it more responsibly, but we're all used to just plugging something in and expecting it to work. What this cord does is not only let us know when things are plugged in, but also how much energy we're using while things are plugged in so that if you turn up the volume, the cord gets brighter. How many people think they might make different decisions if you knew how much energy you were using and think that this might help you do that? And I'm curious if people could take that idea um, and where would they hook this up to? What kinds of things do they think they might be surprised about in terms of their energy use? I think you might be very su surprised how often you use your s when you plug in your cell phone or your um, iPod, for example, that once it's fully charged, you leave it, I don't know, I sometimes very guilty of this myself, I leave them plugged in even when they're fully charged because I'm not quite aware that that energy is still being used. Right, or video games, people leave their TV or their video games on all day and it's using energy all day. And this is a great example of how design creates that awareness in us that makes us think a little bit differently. Another design that does the same thing is an energy a the energy aware clock also designed in Sweden. And what this clock does is allow us again to see when we use the most energy. So if you look at the clock, you can see that the periods that are brighter and thicker are the times when most energy is being used in your house or your apartment. So if your dishwasher is on at the same time as all your lights, um, that's a time when your house is using a lot of energy. And this is a great way again to plan to use things more effectively. So far, in terms of the problems that we've been looking at that are being solved by design, would you say that the the problems are global or world problems that are common to everyone, but that we're seeing perhaps different ways of approaching solutions? Well, I'd say, you know, in highly developed countries like the U.S. or Sweden, we use a lot of energy. Um, and in uh, many northern European countries, there's a much stronger culture than we have in the U.S. of trying to fix that and trying to be conscious of it and trying to solve some of the problems of waste and overconsumption. Partly they have less land than we have. They can't just bury their trash. They have to look at it. Um, so that's, that's a big difference. But then when you look at developing countries where people don't even have access to electricity on a routine basis, they're not going to have so much use for an energy aware clock. Right. Right. So we're, we're <coughs> looking at problems that are universal. Everybody needs energy. Everybody needs clean water. But we all use it in different mm -hmm. amounts and have different access to it. And I think, Ellen, that goes back to our point about the user. That for, you know, those of us who live in America or other places that use a lot of power, for us it's very important to be reminded of how much we're using, where some of the other solutions for people who live in developing countries might be focused more exclusively on what they need. The next design is one of my favorites. This, take, this is the invisible street light designed in Korea. Can everybody find the street light? It's a great example of taking something that's usually invasive when you walk down the street, right? You see, you have those poles. What this does is take those lights and make them invisible so they go right into the screen. They're also solar powered, so they gather their energy during the day, which gives them enough power to work at night. It also, when we look at some of the things that make designs good, is, I think, an incredibly beautiful one. It's amazing. Often in certain countries around certain holidays, people put lights up on the trees to make them mm -hmm. beautiful during holidays. And yet someone said, why do we wait for once or twice a year to do something like this? And then added that energy efficiency component. People are commenting a bit just about how beautiful this is. They can see why it's your favorite example, too. Yes, it really is. I, I think it's incredibly beautiful. And you're right. It's kind of making it seem festive all year round. Right. right it's collecting energy during the day and then giving it back at night, which is beautiful. And, you know, a few people have commented that design is beautiful, um, and really the best design is a beautiful solution that enhances our sense of pleasure as well as serving a function. Um, a, a phone, right, like cell phones are something that many of us feel a lot of personal excitement and joy about, and we'd love to hear from you how much you like your phone. My phone looks like this one, and I have to say, to me, it is a work of art. 
it's something that is is personal to me it's something that contains way more than phone numbers it, it contains a big part of my life and a lot of people have that kind of um, emotional attachment to objects especially when we can personalize them <laughs> We're looking at the results of this uh, fun poll we've got about people's relationship to their phone. And uh, we either, we have, th uh, the most people are choosing, almost half are choosing that they like it, but the next largest are those who couldn't care less. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe people don't love their phone as much as Ellen does. <laughs> <laughs> well, some very people good. are saying they don't get very much rece good reception in the mountains, so it's not a practical solution for some people, too. Right. I see somebody saying they'd like to have a solar-powered phone. I think that's really a terrific idea, and that, that's an idea that some other people in the world have as well. Um, so Nokia is a cell phone manufacturer who actually went around the world and went to, went to some of the poorest cities of the world, in India, in Ghana, in Brazil, went to neighborhoods where people have very, very little, and they, they um, don't have much uh, access to electricity or to clean water or to some of the resources we've been talking about. And it turns out the people that live in those places are the next big wave of cell phone consumers and that cell phones are really a tool for um, communicating, um, for working, for exchanging information, for selling goods. And so Nokia talked to people in these neighborhoods and said, what would what would your ideal cell phone be? And it's interesting what some of the answers were. Solar power was one of them. If you can't charge your phone by plugging into an electrical outlet, you're going to want to use the sun to do it. Um, and people wanted cell phones that would help protect them from violence, cell phones that would um, become a tool for creating neighborhood peace. So a lot of hope is attached to this technology. And then bicycles, you know, bicycles are about 150 years old as a, t as a technology. They're used all over the world as a primary source of, of transportation, as well as a form of recreation. Um, some people ride them every day to work, to school. Um, they're used by police officers. They're used to deliver groceries to people. And of course, they're used for fun. And designers spend a lot of time thinking about how to make bikes better. And we're interested in where you use your bike. And I see a lot of people, it's, it's a recreational um, device. In the future, we hope to see more and more people using bikes every day, but there's some problems with that, right? Because you can't necessarily take a bike into your classroom with you. It might be hard to get it up your steps if you live in an apartment building. So this is an amazing bicycle. It's called the If Mode Bike, and it's a folding bike. And the designers actually created the shape by starting with how cool it looked folded. And then they figured out how to unfold it and create that full-size bike. And what they want to see in the future is, is for the bike to be as everyday an object for working people as a laptop or a cell phone, that it's simply something you would carry with you. And in order to do that, it's got to be able to fold down, and it can't have greasy chains that get all over your work clothes or your school clothes. There's a lot of design problems there to be solved, and if designers can solve them, this then could become really the transportation solution for many, many people into the future. And there's a big movement afoot to make that happen. Somebody's uh, curious, by the way, about this object, if you, if you know a sense of as, as to how much this might weigh, or is it heavy? I think it weighs about 10 pounds, but that, that's a guess. Yeah, but it is designed to be easy to carry around. People are also curious as to whether a bike like this at this point is expensive. Yeah, I think this is still a pretty expensive bike, um, but as you know, these things become less expensive as the demand goes up. And the more people that, that want to carry their bike to work, the cheaper it's going to get. You know, not only objects can be designed, but also whole systems <coughs> or experiences can be designed. And here's an example. This is the MIT city car. And of course, one of the really cool things about this is the actual design of the car. But it's not just one car that one person can buy. It's actually a system that's very different from private car ownership. The idea of this is to provide transportation on demand 
in cities. So what somebody can do with this car is not only um, pick it up where they want by swiping a credit card, but they can pick them up, they can pick it up at a place like this, which is also a charging station. And this, the cars are actually foldable and stackable as well, so that you could swipe your card, get, get, get it charged, take it where you want, and then leave it on at another station. And the idea behind this is that it's so convenient that it will, keep, it will be a great alternative to people having their own cars. Plus, I think it's pretty cute. <laughs> Very important that it be cute. <laughs> Here's another system. This is an incubator made for taking care of little babies that are born too early. And in many parts of the world, there's not a lot of access to this very essential technology that saves lives. But what happens is that when highly technologically advanced countries donate incubators to poorer countries, the, the machines don't last very long because people don't know how to fix them when they break. They get damaged by electrical surges and they get damaged by use and no one really knows how to take care of them. So it's kind of a, a temporary thing that pretty quickly becomes junk. So some doctors were observing that in many, many parts of the world where there's poverty, there are still cars, trucks, and motorcycles and there's people that know how to fix them and how to get the parts to keep them in working order. So this design for an incubator is actually made from motorcycle parts and car parts. Um, and the idea is that if this was implemented in these parts of the world, there would already be people there who knew how to fix it. So it uses an alarm, it uses a motorcycle battery, it uses various parts from existing vehicles to create this life-saving piece of medical technology. And so here the designers are really thinking about the overall system and not just a machine that you go put someplace and hope people can make use of it, but really creating something that's designed to, um, to make sense in the world where it's used. You know, Ellen, this reminds me actually of the f example we talked about very at the beginning with the tennis balls. And although these are very different examples and this is a very sophisticated life-saving event um, device, the design process was exactly the same. It was looking at what the user needed it was also, <coughs> excuse me, taking what was available. So just like your tech librarian might have tennis balls available to him or her to solve a problem in your school, this is an example of looking at the, what was around these communities that could be repurposed like those tennis balls to do something that would now save a lot of lives. But the process is exactly the same. It's interesting, Stephen in Cincinnati is pointing out that it's particularly elegant in that there are mechanics the world over. So systems like this right. are extremely maintainable, not just in an individual community, but these could be serviced uh, at many locations around the world. Exactly. It's, it's tying into a knowledge base that exists. And so suddenly you have medical technicians that used to be mechanics mm -hmm. can now fix medical equipment. We're going to stick to our medical solution theme here for a little bit and remind everybody that as we keep seeing throughout these examples that sometimes some very big challenges can have very simple solutions. This is actually, you know, one of the problems in the world is that over half a billion people need glasses. But because of the, the realities of their lives, they don't have access to trained eye care specialists. They don't have affordable glasses or even places that have the equipment to test their eyes and make these glasses. And in many communities, you know, just like, you know, for us, if your ability to see is limited, that can really dramatically impact your life. And um, Joshua Silver from England designed this um, eye care system called AdSpecs. And what this does, it's a very um, brilliant design. It avoids the whole notion of um, both the testing and the lenses, and it actually lets the user make their own glasses. Right, that what you see in the side with the pump is the user can inject liquid in that makes the glasses the thickness that he or she needs. So one pair of glasses could last somebody's whole life and they can change it based on their ability to see. 
What do people out there think about this solution to this problem? Yeah, imagine if you could change your own glasses. That's really great. Like, I'm nearsighted and farsighted. <laughs> so my glasses have a double lens, but it'd be really cool if I could just push a button and change the lens. Yeah, I see a lot of people saying, wow. There are some people saying they need that. <laughs> and what a great savings in so many ways. Well, it, it, people are asking about the fluid. Do we know is it w what kind of fluid it is? Um, I'm not really sure whether it's it's uh, silicone oil. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's an oil, so it doesn't evaporate. Good question. So we thought we'd we'd um, sort of wrap it up here by talking a little bit about the design process and Caroline. Um, explained how that process used with the tennis balls in the classroom is really the same as the design process for a very high-tech invention like the car parts incubator. Um, so the first thing you do is you define a problem. Um, so here's a problem that um, I've done with my students um, where um, we talked about laundromats. Okay, now a lot of people think laundromats are really depressing places, right? They're ugly, they're inconvenient, they have bad light, it's boring to go to the laundromat. I don't know anybody who looks forward to going to the laundromat. However, from an ecological and economic point of view, laundromats are really smart, right? They save space in your house that would have to be devoted to these appliances. It saves money. You don't have to buy your own equipment. And it's way more sustainable, way more green. It's less stuff. So we thought, well, a really good design problem is how could you make laundromats a fun place to go? Um, so the first part of that, that problem is, is you kind of say, what do you want? We want to get people to go to the laundromat. And then you start to brainstorm. What could we do to make a laundromat a better place? Well, you can make it more beautiful. Designers always want to think about beautiful. It's a big part of what we do. We also like to think about function. What if going to the laundromat meant I could do more stuff, like I could bring my dog, or I could have a cup of coffee, or I could meet guys, or I could have a slice of pie, or work out, or have childcare, right? Those are all things that could be happening at a laundromat that would make it a lot more fun for me to go there. So the next thing that you do is you start to decide which of those things do you want to develop, which ones are viable. So designers brainstorm and then they choose some ideas that they're going to develop. And then they start to sketch, they start to imagine what would it really be like if I had, wow, um, a, a cafe laundromat where I could go and, and meet people and maybe have a tour <coughs> while I'm doing my laundry. Or have a workout, right? If it, if it took me three hours to do the wash, but I was also getting healthy and fit, maybe I'd be more excited about going out to the laundromat. Um, so that's a little picture of the design process, and it's something that you can do with your own problems and with the world's problems. Look right around you at things that annoy you, at the little stuff, but also the big stuff, and think about how you can use the design process to change it, to make it better. Uh, really great. And would you say that everything we've looked at today has followed, in terms of its design process, would have followed these steps, and perhaps even in this order? Yeah, I mean, this is really a universal process for designers. This is what this is what we do. This is how designers think, um, and it, and it happens at small scales and at big scales, and this is how the world's problems can be solved. We have an interesting question that comes from a, a participant in Indonesia, who says, "How does the design process, um, or how is the design process and public planning related?" Do you see the design informing public planning decisions in different ways in different parts of the world? Well, planning and design are very related. Um, and whenever you have a process where people can step back and actually analyze the problem before they solve it, that really is design thinking at work. Um, what happens is it's often hard to implement the ideas. And when you have people arguing and not able to um, to come together on a solution, that is a big issue. And I think one of the things, in tr especially in something like public planning, is that sometimes all of the users are not taken into consideration. 
and the ability to sort of use that design process to really see what those users would like or need as part of their lives in a city would be very important. I see some good questions here about the laundromat, including the question, doesn't travel to the laundromat negate some of the environmental benefit? And that is a good question. Um, we like to think about, you know, the laundromat as a neighborhood amenity, that if you were walking, then that's actually using positive energy yourself to get there. But th those are good questions about how that might function. I think we've become so used to having everything right in our own house. Um, it gets hard to get out of that mindset of sharing some of these facilities. But think about going to a restaurant, right? It's kind of fun to get out of the house sometimes that's and not do all your own cooking. <laughs> that's a good point. And sometimes we food is a basic need, but it's also a time to build relationships and be with family or friends. And laundry is a basic need, I suppose, too. So we it could sure do, is. <laughs> we could do some of those other things while doing laundry. Um, there's a lot of great follow-up questions. People are questioning the design, adding their own elements to it, reincorporating some of the ones they've seen in the chat here today as well. Um, here's one someone in Saskatoon says there's a laundromat that has a cafe incorporated in it, as Ellen mentioned. That's terrific. They even have bands in the evening, so it was about the liveliest laundromat Robert had ever seen. That's a great solution. Yeah, I think it is about a new generation thinking about these basic problems from a new angle. I can't help but think what Atesh, our first speaker today, talked about uh, music in everyday life. would think about bands playing in a laundromat and how the sounds of the machines might recombine to form new albums that Smithsonian Folkways might publish. <laughs> right, that's a great <laughs> idea. Great. By the way, a quick question here from uh, uh, Barta, Barti, who's curious about your, your backgrounds, how you came to be interested in design and to be here sitting in this chair with us today. The short version, I suppose, is what they're looking for. Sure. Well, <laughs> I'm a graphic designer. I went to art school and discovered that design was a kind of art that was public and that had a social purpose. And that really excited me. And I discovered it was a field that could occupy me for the rest of my life. And so now I'm a museum curator and a writer and a teacher. And I have devoted myself to letting people know how design can change your life. And I actually started off as a teacher, and I was actually an English teacher. Um, but one of the things I did started to do a lot of is a lot of professional development and a lot of um, technology and web-based projects that help teachers be more effective in the classroom and become better teachers. And so um, design for me has become not something I do, but a, a way that I think um, can help teachers um, be more effective in the classroom and help students learn by making students think like they're designers and to start solving problems, not only design problems, but maybe the problem of their English paper or the problem of a science assignment and use the same process of looking at the problem, coming up with several solutions, and you know testing that out and talking about their work. Um, so for me, design maps against a lot of other classroom skills. I'm so happy that you mentioned that. And it was right on cue for our friend from Kansas City who was curious about how the design approach you described would apply to the design of instruction. So very clever way of reapplying. Now, here's an interesting question from Allison. Can you think of? certain kinds of problems that the design process could not address? Hmm. We like to think that design is really a fundamental way of thinking. You know, it's, it's similar to scientific method where you also have to de define a problem and then, you know, test different ways to solve it. I, I guess the difference is that it's less linear. And I think also one of the things that's very important in design is that idea that there's no right or wrong answer and although there might be a design solution that might not absolutely do the thing that it's supposed to do at the end that process of asking those questions and articulating it and trying and retrying things will probably make for a better ultimate solution even if the one chosen doesn't isn't the best solution for the problem at the moment uh, here's an interesting question here from Chris at Coffee Middle School. He's, he says, how do we get out of the mindset that we're always looking for solutions to problems? Should we get out of that mindset? Or is that how you approach the world? We love thinking that way, but that's why we're, <laughs> we're part of design. I mean, um, 
you know, I think artists have a different point of view, that artists are about creating form, about uh, telling stories that really are just there to, um, to enrich us, right? To provide pleasure, to stimulate the mind, to surprise us. But design is different from art. De design is always reacting to some kind of human situation. And that makes it a different activity. And I think there's lots of room in life for both, for just um, relaxing and enjoying the sunset. Um, and I think designers tend to be constantly looking at everything for a problem. Does the door open right? Does the light switch, is it in the right spot? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a very critical kind of uh, viewpoint. So yes, yeah, certainly there are times when you should just shut up and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of enjoying things, I understand that there is an exhibition coming up that for those uh, who have access to the Cooper Hewitt might enjoy seeing in person, but there may be other ways for them to experience it as well. Absolutely. Um, we are the Triennial Exhibition, and by Triennial, we, triennial um, I noticed a couple of kids had that question. We mean an exhibition that we have every three years. Um, our Triennial Exhibition will be opening on May 14th. We'll also have a website on this our webs a website on the exhibition so people can take a look at it through there. We also have um, on our website many resources about not only this exhibition but our other exhibitions and a very robust educator resource center where we have over 350 standards-based lesson plans that bring the design process into your classroom for all subject areas. We have lesson plans K through 12 and they include lessons for math, science, social studies, <coughs> and language arts as well as um, art lessons. It's an exciting exhibit and we'll of course post the link to the virtual version of the exhibition on the virtual exhibit hall when that is uh, when that opens. A an interesting question comes in from a participant, um, uh, Maria Jose in Nicaragua, who wants to know your opinion on this. Does design equal expensive? No, definitely not. A, a well-designed solution can be very inexpensive, and we'll go back to the tennis balls on the bottom of a chair. I don't know if you were here at the beginning of the program, but you know, many classrooms will create a more quiet furniture by putting tennis balls on chair legs. Mm -hmm. That doesn't cost anything. It's using a discarded element that, that's already there or creating a classroom out of abandoned um, tires is a very mm -hmm. inexpensive solution. Or the incubator made out of abandoned car parts or m motorcycle parts as well is a very inexpensive solution to a problem much more, inexp more inexpensive and sustainable than buying very expensive incubators and not having people around who can fix them. I hope we're all looking at the world a little bit differently after your session. Um, I know I am, and I hope you give yourselves more credit for some of the innovative ways you each approach problem solving, and perhaps in seeing some of these that are making it into a Cooper Hewitt exhibition, and certainly into our problem solving session today, you are inspired to uh, keep looking at the world as a a way to put your touch on it and improve it. So we thank everyone. We want to thank Ellen and Caroline for a great session, and we're seeing lots of uh, kudos coming your way here in the uh, the chat area, and lots of continued ideas about laundromats. So I expect a lot of clean laundry <laughs> and a lot of fun at laundromats around the world in the coming weeks and, and years. I do want to pass the mic momentarily over to Allison Knox from Microsoft, who's been a gracious sponsor of the uh, event, and I'd like her to say a couple of words. Thanks so much, and thank you everyone for joining today, and thank you to our um, final presenters. I, I, the session was just really interesting and intriguing, and the whole day. So thank you to Smithsonian and to Stephanie and Stevie and her team for, and Learning Times for producing and creating this um, rich and informational um, content. But what I wanted to do was simply say that Microsoft U.S. Partners in Learning is very pleased to be a sponsor of today's conference and the next two day that will be happening at the end of April and that I know that many teachers and students out there, um, people in general, are interested in um, going further with what you've been learning yesterday and today and there is a way that you can do that by um, playing a mission-based game that we are designing and are launching on April 29th which is the last day of the four-day conference and so instead of explaining all about it what I'd like you to do is just go to www.playintarobang.com and it's P-L-A-Y-I-N-T-E 
R R O B A N G. And there's also a link on the um, Smithsonian Online Conference website that you can link to. And go ahead and learn more about our missions that are designed to help people um, explore this content more. Um, and, um, and then we will be in contact with you about our next steps. So we look forward to interacting with you further after these conferences and also look forward to reconnecting the last week of April for the next um, conference session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Allison. And check out the game, sign up, and uh, you'll be able to uh, stay up to date with how that game unfolds. Don't forget, as Allison just mentioned, we're all reconvening later in April for two more days of great sessions. We'll be exploring uh, the topics of mysteries of the universe. And if you miss it, those mysteries will remain mysteries to you. So do come back to that event. Three great sessions. We'll also be talking about sustaining a biodiverse planet. And you're going to see some incredible organism, organisms and some amazing people who are studying them. And we'll give you a, a really great appreciation for the life on this planet, not just the search for life and mysteries in the universe. So check out both of those days. It will be really be incredible. We put up a quick feedback form for you on the top left of your screen. And we'd love a little feedback for this session. And uh, we'll be in touch with all of you with um, some overall feedback for the conference as well. So we'll sign out from Washington, D.C. at the Smithsonian. And we'll look for you in the discussion boards. Keep your questions coming. Check out the exhibit hall for all the continued research. And we'll see you online. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>